Essentially, what this course is what uh, I wanted to accomplish during my sabbatical. And some of my introduction uh, to the course here, I think hopefully will put this in perspective about where the epidemiologist is in terms of a field that is moving as fast as genetics. And that is, uh, it's kind of like two ways to interact with a steamroller. You can either be under it or driving it. And certainly prior to this, uh, I felt like I was under it. So um, let me just uh, give you some perspectives. Just to say, um, in terms of conflicts of interest, um, the, um, I don't have any, uh, or Dr. Manolio has uh, no interest in many of the genomics companies, et cetera, but, um, um, but we do make cakes. Um, so let me, uh, let me just put this into perspective. And some of you have been... Uh, uh, editors of journals, and some of you have been on study sections, and some of you have been in the audiences at meetings, and this is what happens. Okay, this is a genome-wide association study of Crohn's disease. It looked at 300,000 SNPs in 540 uh, patients with Crohn's disease and 928 controls. This is an epidemiology study, okay, classic case control study. The analysis confirmed two genes that they'd previously seen, one in chromosome 1 and one in chromosome 15 and 16. And then there was this other region on chromosome 15 with multiple SNPs associated. This was replicated in a study with another study with 1,266 cases and 559 controls and 428 trios. The SNPs that were then associated, these new SNPs, were located in the gene desert. Um, 270 kilobytes proximal to a prostaglandin receptor gene whose expression looks like it was controlled by this. And there you are. Are you comfortable yet? Certainly as I sat on or chaired study sections, there was a whole lot of words up there and a whole lot of technology that got them to those words that I didn't have a clue about. The last time I took a genetics course was 1971. Okay. And I think uh, our geneticist friends would probably suggest there's been a little bit of activity in genetics since 1971. So this is where I think I'm a, a classically trained cardiovascular geneticist, uh, epidemiologist, sorry. And, um, and so this new genetic epidemiology, genomic, population genomics, obviously we want to, for the, this course, is fill in some of the questions you might have about um, what all of this means, what are the strengths and the weaknesses uh, of this kind of research. So who's the target audience? Bummer of a birthmark, Hal. Well, the target audience really is for uh, investigators, uh, epidemiologists or population-based investigators uh, who, um, who really would benefit from being familiarized with the developments in the theory and methods of human genetics and genomics. Um, in your handout, uh, you'll see the learning objectives for this course. Uh, this will be eight lectures. Uh, there will be a number of uh, case studies relative to some of the papers uh, in the literature, as I'll mention in one moment. Hopefully, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, and this is being webcast by the NHGRI. Um, and um, we want to thank uh, Larry and Maggie for, um, for joining us for that so that it will be archived if, in fact, there were um, uh, other um, um, needs to go back and, uh, and look at the material. Uh, let me just say is, is that as a teaching tool, and this is also a research tool, one of the things that we've um, uh, relied on as a repository is something relatively new over the past few months, and that's the NHGRI Catalog of Genome-Wide Association Studies. This is uh, an activity by several of our colleagues in um, Terry Manolio's uh, Office of, um, of Population Genomics. And this basically um, takes all publications uh, reporting genome-wide association studies beginning in March 2005, uh, in which the platform used at least 100,000 uh, single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms, um, the density of that uh, magnitude, uh, and these were your typical uh, search uh, of the literature uh, in terms of these studies. Uh, and you can see a, a variety of uh, types of data 
uh, that are all cataloged there. So uh, we put in the, uh, the website there for you, but this is a real uh, asset if you want to go and really see. Um, now, I always uh, am dangerous to say how many there are in there. I will tell you, as of um, September 30th, there were 109 studies. Um, uh, if you don't, if you count all the Framingham and the um, uh, um, the um, uh, um, and uh, and a couple of others that were multiple studies in one, but uh, uh, again, uh, now it's probably uh, closer to 150 or something as this field moves along very rapidly. So, what I want to do uh, uh, for this first lecture is to provide an overview uh, of the course which I've just done. I'd like to also review the the structure and uh, function of the human genome, just so that we can get some of those words and terms right. Um, review the patterns of inheritance, which are obviously going to be thrown around and will be models for some of our epidemiologic um, uh, investigations in terms of genetic causes of disease. Uh, talk about some types of human uh, genetic variations or mutations, which we would uh, consider as potential causes for disease. And then, uh, at the end, um, identify some online informatics resources um, which uh, talk about the uh, genotype and phenotype of human genetic variants. And a couple of them, I think, should be um, uh, uh, certainly on your, uh, on your uh, favorite button on your uh, computer. So let's uh, start with, uh, with talking a little bit about uh, the uh, basic uh, genetics, and genetics is the science of inheritance. It's about 100 years old. Uh, the genetic code, of course, is uh, begins with Watson and Crick describing the uh, double helix, and uh, that uh, is a little over 50 years old. Uh, and the uh, field of genomics, as uh, coined by Roderick, is, uh, uh, is perhaps a little bit over 20 years old which is that field concerned with the structure and function of the entire DNA sequence uh, in a population or individual um, as defined by Roderick. And there, you can see some of the variations, but the idea of, of uh, genetics, the science of inheritance, the subfield um, uh, of genomics being part of that, of looking at the uh, whole genome. Now, what we're really involved with here is taking an immensely complex biological system and trying to hone down to really identify those variations in the system which are important in causing disease. So, of course, we have 46 chromosomes. Um, we believe that there are 20 to 25,000 uh, genes in there, functional genes in terms of producing a gene product or a protein. Uh, the, there are about 3 billion case uh, base pairs, um, um, that's haploid, 6 billion if you count uh, each base, uh, uh, and of these, 99.9% .9 of them are the same between all of us in this room. However, if you've got 3 billion base pairs, 0.1%, 1 in 1,000, still leaves a lot of variation. And so that's where the money is in terms of identifying those very variants that uh, may be related to disease. So we really have, uh, according to these figures, Simmons, your department has lost another number two double in, and I want you to find it. So there's the haystack, and it looks like it's a number two needle. And so this is essentially the challenge is finding within the the uh, entire genome, those issues uh, which are important for human health. Well, here's the, um, here's the haystack, and we had a little conference this afternoon. We decided that there was, there were about uh, uh, two, uh, about six feet of DNA in every cell. So can you imagine how many cells you have? So you, each of you have enough DNA to go from here to Bethesda, or maybe further. Um, and so here it is, all of this uh, DNA pulled out from uh, the chromatin uh, pulled out, and you can see these literally feet and feet and feet uh, of, of uh, this genetic material, which is made up of, of course, uh, a chain 
uh, in which um, the, the two helices are uh, hooked together by these base pairs, uh, and um, adenine, thymidine, guanine, and cytosine, uh, which um, are hooked on to a deoxyribose uh, sugar with a phosphate to it, and then these are linked together. And what you will see is when they say the three prime and the five prime end is to orient you which way the DNA is going for purposes of, say, uh, uh, transcription, et cetera, um, the five prime end here is uh, where the phosphate is, and the three prime end here is where this, this uh, hydroxyl group is. Uh, and here you can see the deoxyribose hooked together with phosphates, and these form a chain, and then these bases are coming off, and then they link with these hydrogen bonds uh, to a, another chain, and then wrap up in the double helix that Watson and Crick uh, described. And the importance of these hydrogen bonds, obviously, is that these are relatively weak bonds, which can um, separate and go back together. And that's obviously, that's important because that's how DNA replicates. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is what we're talking about, is little variations within literally a single base pair unit affecting the structure of what they encode, uh, and that, in fact, going on to cause uh, disease. So that what you'll see in the literature, certainly in the, in the genome-wide association study literature, uh, are a variety of terms, exons, introns, and a whole bunch of regulatory elements, promoters, the poly A tail, enhancers, silencers, and the control regions. Uh, and the point is, is that each of these have a meaning. Uh, exons are the part which actually encodes uh, usually in, in several uh, different segments of protein, the actual um, parts of the uh, gene product or the protein. Introns are, are, um, uh, are between these uh, exons, kind of spacers, which are then uh, uh, spliced out uh, uh, during the whole um, processing of the, uh, of, the, um, of the genetic material. And then uh, there are a variety of regulatory elements which turn on and turn off uh, the gene. So what we have here is, is this promoter, which um, is a place acted upon, can be acted upon to really uh, start this transcription, which occurs here. And then these blue bars are the places within um, the gene which are actually coding the protein of the gene. Uh, in between these are these which are, uh, are uh, transcribed, and, but as you'll see later, then spliced out. Uh, and then you have uh, a codon which says stop, uh, and uh, this poly A uh, signal here at the end uh, which tops um, uh, transcription um, with this whole region uh, back here. And these are a variety of genes. So this is the breast cancer gene, beta globulin. And you can see that the structure of these is really quite variable uh, and part of the truly elegant uh, variation in how the uh, the genes um, are structured. So the, the, the story does not get any simpler with uh, transcription where uh, you have your, your, um, your gene transcribed. It's um, a, uh, a, um, an initiation a um, sequence, a promoter sequence that starts. So this transcription starts and RNA is formed. Um, the RNA then um, uh, is uh, goes along and is a, a process where these intron uh, areas are then spliced out, uh, leaving then your uh, RNA ready uh, for translation uh, out into the cytosol where the ribosomes then make the protein products. And so the point is, is that uh, you have a lot of places uh, to start and to finish and the structure and these splices, a lot more than just a, 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 a little code that uh, that is read out in some way, but a lot of other elements that could be varying that could alter uh, how that uh, gene product is produced. And we're going to talk about later with, uh, for example, the, um, uh, the GWAS study that I showed you on Crohn's disease, uh, there's a gene out here in the gene desert. Well, there doesn't seem to be any known exons out there that encode anything. What is, what is happening with this polymorphism? 
Well, again, you can see that many of these regulatory elements, et cetera, may be um, where that um, gene is acting. And just important to understand that some of these other things uh, act there and could be targets for, for variation. So the genetic code then, uh, uh, attributable to um, Watson Crick, uh, are those sequences of the four DNA pairs uh, that are, are uh, translated in triplets. So what you have is the triplets uh, as 64 codons, um, uh, each which encode um, uh, an amino acid with the exception of some stop codons. Uh, so this is the genetic code, the 64 um, variations um, of, uh, uh, of a triplet, each of which could be one of four um, uh, bases. Uh, some of the 20 amino acids, therefore, there are only 20 amino acids to make up proteins, which are encoded by this. So obviously, uh, you have 64 and 20. There's more than one codon will, will encode some of the amino acids. And then three of the, uh, the codons are stop codons, which basically terminate translation uh, of, the, um, of the RNA. Now, uh, there are a variety of opportunities to have uh, variants in there. Um, one could argue some of these variants are deleterious um, and, and may be called mutations, but this could occur at the level of the, uh, of the, uh, the whole genome, uh, at the level of the chromosome, and at the level of the gene. Uh, and um, you can see here uh, examples of Obviously, uh, trisomy 21 is actually having three chromosome 21, so you'll have chromosome segregation. Chromosomal rearrangement frequently occurs in cancer cells, uh, and we're going to talk a lot about single nucleotide polymorphisms today, which is a single base pair mutation, but there's a lot of others that uh, both I and Terry in the next lecture are going to talk about in terms of variables. So the whole thing becomes extremely elegant, but also extremely complicated, and I think it's our job really is just to provide you with some of uh, uh, notion of the, um, the level of uh, variability that we have here. Now, when we talk about single nucleotide substitutions, uh, there are a variety of terms you'll also see in describing the results of a study. Uh, synonymous or silent mutations are one where you may change a base, but the, the base that it's changed to also codes for the same amino acid. So even though there is a variability, there's no change in the amino acid produced, and so there's really no effect on the amino acid sequence. It is a variant, but it doesn't do anything. There's this missense, or the non-synonymous, in which um, that one base pair, in fact, changed the code for amino acid, and that amino acid sequence change then can have, of course, effects on the protein uh, structure and function, et cetera. Uh, the nonsense um, um, mutations encodes the termination uh, codon and obviously changes the way that uh, uh, the, um, um, the uh, gene does or does not turn off. And the termination um, mutation destroys the, the termination codon, and so it continues to uh, transcribe um, into the next gene. And so it may not only affect the gene being encoded, but also the adjacent genes perhaps encoding other things. So these are some terms you'll hear. And so when they say we, we believe that the defect here is a, um, is a uh, missense uh, codon and such and such, uh, you'll understand what that means. So um, uh, uh, obviously this is the uh, genetic code. This would uh, encode a... Uh, um, uh, a series of amino acids which would uh, be uh, translated into, um, into protein. Uh, you can see where you could substitute, a single substitute, so your SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, will be um, related to this. Uh, you can also have uh, deletions uh, or insertions in which, and of course, this will cause a frame shift so that since these are in triplets, all of them will be different and, of course, then the protein um, and the amino acids uh, translated here will be obviously totally different than the amino acids translated here and obviously uh, cause a, uh, perhaps a dysfunctional protein. So um, the deletions, insertions, when they're talking about it, that's what they're, they're talking about. Now, Terry's going to talk uh, more about um, these indels, the deletions and insertions. Uh, 
some of them are, um, are simple. They only involve a short segment of DNA and, and perhaps only affect um, two alleles um, um, where, where, the, um, uh, where, where the, uh, the deletion or insertion occurs. Uh, some of them are much more complex. Uh, one term would be the short tandem repeat polymorphisms um, where you have a variety of repeat units, um, nucleotide units repeated over quite a number of times. And this could affect a number of, uh, of alleles. Um, um, variable number repeats are larger nucleotide repeat units. Again, can be re um, repeated hundreds of times. And Terry's going to give you some uh, practical examples of, uh, of something that we in cardiovascular epidemiology, for example, study um, uh, lipoprotein little a. Uh, something that I think is uh, perhaps the next uh, uh, area of particular interest and concentration are the copy number variants. Uh, these are uh, larger segments of DNA, um, which um, which are, um, um, are are duplicated and um, uh, and affect a few alleles. And the important part here is that some of the newer uh, genotyping um, uh, technologies are going to be able to. Uh, start measuring these and um, being included in genome-wide association studies. Uh, so currently, we're particularly doing a lot with SNPs, and I think this is uh, one of the next uh, areas that we're going to be uh, able to measure. I want to um, briefly talk a little bit about uh, uh, inheritance. This uh, is something that you should have uh, had from, uh, from your basic uh, um, uh, biology or or, um, or a human genetics course, uh, uh, but just to say that um, it is uh, important to just um, uh, go over the, the terms again as we go forward. Uh, the Mendel's principles of inheritance, obviously, is segregation. Is that a pair of alleles, um, a uh, um, uh, a pair of uh, uh, of of genes. Uh, um, for any particular trait, um, variance in uh, of encoding the trait, uh, they separate, and only one allele passes from each parent to the offspring. Uh, and which allele is passed is, is random. So that goes gets back to Mendel's experiments with his peas, uh, and that these traits are encoded by different pairs of alleles or inherited independence of each other, unless they're genetically linked. And we're going to talk about that because this is an important uh, part of our um, our ability to measure quite a bit of the human genome without measuring each and every uh, base pair, uh, this is the concept of linkage. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about OMIM, the Mendelian Traits uh, um, Catalog, Online Mendelian Inheritance of Man. Uh, and at least of last summer, um, this was the, the number of uh, autosomal genes um, that are listed in that catalog. There's X-linked genes, there's a few Y-linked genes, and some mitochondrial genes. We'll talk about the inheritance patterns of each of these. Uh, but you can see, obviously, most of them are autosomal and, uh, and X-linked, and each of these would have uh, inheritance patterns. So um, what classically we've been talking about, let's say, uh, up to, um, uh, what would you say, the late 1990s, perhaps, uh, would be more of a Mendelian uh, disease pattern, perhaps maybe earlier than that, um, would be a, uh, conditions which are almost, uh, caused almost entirely by a single major gene. So when we talk about a Mendelian disorder, it's one of those major gene disorders. Uh, and uh, they look, um, they, they express themselves as uh, manifesting only one uh, or two of the three possible genotype groups. Um, and so when we test for um, Mendelian inheritance, um, obviously um, uh, the diseases are, are, are uh, being in, um, uh, inherited in this way, recessive or dominant uh, forms. Uh, and uh, we all know about uh, our favorite uh, Mendelian disease of familial hypercholesterolemia, um, Marfan syndrome, a variety of the classic described um, uh, diseases um, uh, with dominant or recessive patterns. Uh, more uh, current in terms of, of the questions of the day, 
or is this common disease, common variant idea um, in which you have uh, common diseases, so diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, the cancers, et cetera, uh, are not uh, caused by a single major gene, um, but rather attributable to a, a limited number of variations uh, which occur uh, in, say, 1% or perhaps 5% or more of the population. So um, you have uh, multiple forms which occur um, uh, in relatively frequent, these are not rare variants, but relatively frequent variants, which then, when put all together, uh, would uh, explain uh, the genetic basis uh, for some of our most common afflictions. And I think this is where the genome-wide association studies uh, and a variety of, uh, of our current uh, activities have focused on for the last uh, uh, 20 years or so. So I think you're all familiar with autosomal dominant inheritance, um, and uh, this is, uh, is obviously um, what it looks like. Uh, about 50 percent of the offspring uh, are, um, are affected. There can be male-to-male -male, uh, uh, transmission. Um, uh, a per, um, person who's phenotypically normal does not translate uh, to their offspring because uh, should be a full penetrance, and men and women are uh, affected equally. So this would be the autosomal dominant uh, pattern. Uh, and again, you all have, um, uh, I'm sure, uh, the diseases in your own area of specialty uh, of interest. And there can be complete and incomplete dominance. Um, just a couple of terms that are used. Complete dominance is where the phenotypes, whether they're heterozygous or homozygous, one or two copies of the gene uh, are present, uh, are indistinguishable. An example of that would be Huntington's disease, whether you have one or two genes, uh, doesn't matter, uh, you are affected by this uh, debilitating uh, uh, late onset uh, neurologic disease. Uh, incomplete dominance is, is that the phenotypes are more severe in the homozygous than the heterozygous state. Um, uh, I uh, run a lipid clinic. We see a lot of patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. Those are almost all uh, heterozygous with cholesterols in the uh, uh, 300 to 500 range. Uh, the homozygotes uh, we don't usually see because they show up as children uh, with very high cholesterols, uh, 1,000, 1,500. They're very rare. Um, uh, and they also um, do poorly unless they're uh, treated with uh, liver transplantation or other heroic means. So um, this is a, a, an example of incomplete dominance, whereas the homozygotes really uh, are even more severe than the heterozygotes, although the heterozygotes, everyone is affected um, there as well. So a couple of other terms. Autosomal recessive, of course, are the, um, the genes that uh, frequently will be seen in, um, in inbred populations. Um, I um, uh, did my training at Johns Hopkins, and um, Victor McCusick um, um, did many studies in the Amish uh, community there. You'll still see in the literature um, a variety of other um, um, founder populations uh, uh, studied, uh, because this is where uh, some level of consanguinity uh, will have occurred, uh, and um, uh, this will allow um, um, the, um, the recessive trait to occur. So um, if it appears in one family member, it's most likely to appear uh, in a sib ship because those obviously there are two uh, carriers, um, each with uh, heterozygous for the recessive gene up here. Uh, male, female is, uh, is equal. Uh, the the um, the parents of the affected children are uh, asymptomatic. Um, uh, again, there are um, there is increased uh, uh, consanguinity, and this is why some of these uh, these uh, inbred populations are particularly um, um, involved with these um, these um, uh, disorders. Um, and so, uh, the offspring of of two heterozygous parents, such as here, uh, these are are likely to be 25% uh, affected, 50% of these are carriers, and 25% um, uh, of these would be non-carriers just on chance. So your autosomal recessive pattern. Uh, X-linked um, uh, has to do with um, both male and female uh, offsprings of female carriers would have a, um, a uh, 
50% uh, risk of, uh, of inheriting the, um, um, again, this is X-linked dominant, so this, um, this affected person, um, about half of their children, uh, this woman would be um, uh, inheriting the phenotype. There's uh, no uh, male-to-male transmission, uh, because obviously um, uh, these individuals have their uh, X chromosome from um, their mother. Um, the number of women affected is much greater than uh, men, because obviously there's two X chromosomes, uh, and they, they will obviously have to get the X chromosome from their father there, and that means all daughters would be affected. And um, uh, there can be some variation in the uh, severity uh, in the women, because of course uh, that X chromosome can be deactivated. There's uh, the lion hypothesis, the lionization, the uh, inactivation of one of the two X chromosomes uh, occurs. Uh, and uh, vitamin D resistant rickets is an example of this. Thank you. Um, X linked recessive um, is, is that only um, males are affected. So here we have the uh, carriers identified. So you have a male here, and the, uh, all of their daughters um, would be uh, carriers. Uh, and then um, uh, of this carrier woman, um, uh, they're um, uh, related to the carrier females, you would have. Um, uh, the uh, the male cases with the one X chromosome that they have um, um, coming from uh, this this particular um, parent um, and uh, hemophilia A um, or red green color blindness would be uh, an example of that. Um, why a link uh, inheritance uh, again relatively uh, uh, less common. Uh, only the males are affected, obviously. Uh, all sons, but no uh, daughters of affected men are affected, so as um, to rule out other kinds of inheritance. Uh, it's not X-linked since um, male-to-male transmission occurs, and it's sex-limited um, because uh, it cannot occur through unaffected females. And then the final kind of, uh, of inheritance, and something we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about, is obviously inheriting another kind of, of genetic material, uh, particularly from your mother, and that is mitochondrial DNA. This has been of great interest in the tracking of, of um, ancestry, uh, and particularly um, uh, through the maternal line, uh, um, the origins of, uh, of, uh, of racial groups, etc. Um, this inheritance is uh, matrilineal, uh, so it, um, it uh, does not go through the, um, uh, even though um, uh, this individual uh, would be affected uh, with mitochondrial DNA from his mother, he does not pass it on. Uh, the mother passes it on uh, to all of the, uh, all of the children, um, both men and women. So having said that, uh, one might say that uh, the rules of inheritance look quite tidy. In fact, uh, it's, uh, it's not really so. Uh, we have sporadic uh, mutations. Obviously, you can see no evidence of there being any uh, genetic issues in the family, and all of a sudden, you'll have a case. And um, so the suggestion would be that uh, uh, this would be a sporadic mutation. Uh, there is uh, heterogeneity in the... Um, um, in, uh, as you'll see with many of these disorders, there will be several gene defects which can, um, can be causative of them, and each of them can have some differences uh, in their severity. In familial hypercholesterolemia, for example, there are literally dozens of, of forms of this, probably six or eight mechanisms uh, in which um, the, um, the individual um, uh, has the same phenotype, so within that phenotype there actually is some variability uh, in, um, in, um, in the disease. There can be non-penetrance, uh, where uh, a, a disorder simply isn't, um, uh, isn't um, um, expressed. Um, uh, familiar combined hyperlipidemia is a good example, uh, quite a common lipid disorder, for example, uh, but it's the person um, uh, gains weight or um, uh, 
diet exercise issue is much more likely to express that gene than, uh, than otherwise. Uh, you can also have late onset conditions like um, Huntington's, Alzheimer's disease, which may have a strong genetic component but uh, may not look genetic um, uh, because of uh, deaths, et cetera, uh, prior to their uh, age of onset. And you can have sex-limited and sex-influenced uh, phenotypes in which uh, you'll have differences in, um, in the phenotype. So there's a lot of, uh, the point here is, is that um, the autosomal dominant, um, X-linked, uh, recessive, et cetera, uh, obviously are general rules of inheritance, but there are these other uh, things that, um, that uh, affect uh, what's uh, happening. So uh, just a comment on this common variant, uh, common disease hypothesis. So what you can have is I've just shown you the, the uh, various uh, issues that could be going on genetically with uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, in exons, um, uh, in uh, regulatory elements, um, in several genes, in several exons. Uh, the important part of this, though, is, is that their prevalence is common enough to start to explain a common disease. And then put on top of that, of course, is that these all could be interacting. And I think uh, Terry's going to talk a little bit about gene-gene interaction, which is of another whole kettle of fish. And the other problem is that all of these could be obviously interacting with environmental exposure. So you end up with a disease model which, which, um, which is very complicated. And obviously, um, this, I think, should be part of the bailiwick of the epidemiologists who are generally used to uh, teasing out these issues. And all we now have is a lot more complicated data uh, in which to tease out some of these other uh, complex um, associations. And just to give you an idea, um, uh, this is a, uh, a study of uh, lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, looking at a, a genome-wide association study. 720 women with lupus uh, with 2,300 plus controls, uh, over uh, 300,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, assessed across the genome. Um, then almost by, rec really by requirement, there have been two replication studies uh, which uh, constituted in total 1,846 uh, female cases and 1,825 female controls. Um, this was, as I said, a study of all of women. And what they found was at least 17 um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, which were associated at the P less than 2 to the 10 minus to the minus 7th power level of probability. So what you have here is then obviously, uh, and each of these would have a, uh, a gene frequency um, of uh, 5 to, uh, uh, say, 50 percent. Uh, and when you put them uh, all together, then, in a logistic regression model, looking to see how many of these really are independent of others, maybe one's just a neighbor and they're all just kind of, uh, of uh, co-associated, uh, you come up with uh, these uh, six uh, models, which have independent either um, a susceptibility or uh, protective uh, relationships, uh, all significant at uh, somewhere between the 10 to the minus 7th and 10 to the minus 18th uh, level of significance. Um, the C statistic is 0.67 and apparently would account for about 15 percent of heritability. Uh, and so what you're now talking about with lupus, and those of you who've, clinicians who have taken care of lupus patients, uh, obviously um, um, many times you'll see a family history. You get the idea, and we'll, we'll talk about heritability, I think, of lupus a little bit later. Um, uh, and now what we're seeing is really quite a number of, uh, of gene variants uh, which look like they play a role uh, in this disease uh, and, um, and act so independent of each other. So many of these genetic models, I think, to at least my eye, are very complicated. Uh, and obviously are a challenge to, um, to um, ferret out. In the last couple of minutes, uh, what I want to do is uh, just to say that um, that was a kind of a semester-long uh, genetics course in, uh, in about 30 minutes. Um, uh, one of the um, 
um, important aspects of some of that basic genetics is now is that our informatics resources, uh, which have then taken uh, all of that complexity and now is accessible online, I think I've used the wrong colors here, uh, but uh, basically are now all available through the National Center for Biotechnology Information of the National Library of Medicine. And Terry and I took a day-long course on bioinformatics. I think we were the geriatric set in that, uh, that course. Uh, there were, I think everybody was more facile with computers than uh, we were by a long shot. Uh, but uh, the uh, NCBI uh, has a variety of, of uh, resources and particularly OMIM and perhaps GeneBank are something that you can very readily then go and identify the polymorphisms, et cetera, that were maybe in a paper, uh, maybe um, identified in one of your studies, or maybe something that you would like to have measured in one of your studies in which you've had uh, the wherewithal to collect uh, DNA, informed consent, et cetera. And so um, um, uh, we just wanted to list those, and we're going to talk a little bit about each one of them. So OMIM. Um, is an outgrowth of, uh, of uh, Victor McCusick's catalogs of uh, the Mendelian inheritance of man. Um, and um, it, was, um, it was always uh, a lot of fun to go to clinic with, um, with Dr. McCusick. His, all of his patients were average height. Uh, unfortunately, they were either four feet tall or seven feet tall because his two areas of studies was achondroplastic dwarfs or Marfan syndrome. So, so on the average, everybody was about five and a half feet tall, but um, they were all in between. So uh, OMIM is a, um, is a catalog of human genes and genetic disorders, and I think Terry and I would uh, agree that if you want to know one online um, resource, this is the one. Um, it's got concise information on most of the human conditions which have a known genetic basis, pictures, full citations, um, et cetera. Uh, other um, uh, materials are available in the gene bank, and some of these, I think, uh, for at least so in my simplistic uh, um, computer um, uh, skills, are truly amazing uh, collections of all the publicly available DNA and protein sequences, not only in humans, but down to the, um, the round worm, et cetera. Uh, again, uh, a, a huge number of records, uh, description of the sequence, um, the references, uh, and this is all generated by the submitter who um, basically, it's kind of like a, um, um, a uh, wiki, um, Wikipedia uh, kind of activity where um, um, each of these is put in by a submitter. This is a little bit different um, than RefSeq, which is that each molecule in the, in the sequence um, is described, again, this is non-redundant, whereas the other one uh, is redundant. It's re linked to the nucleotide protein sequences in gene bank, uh, and um, it's updated by NCBI staff. Um, DBSNP uh, uh, identifies um, the 6.2 million currently known single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, this is obviously changing every day. We believe there's up to 10 million of them available. Uh, and uh, over 200,000 of them are within genes, so these are related. So another uh, resource uh, for you. So uh, finally, um, from 1900 to the present, human genetics and Mendelian disorders still current. So the things I talked about are still obviously relevant to the practice of clinical, uh, human clinical genetics, et cetera. 1953, obviously, molecular genetics, structure and function of the human genome, um, obviously building on really what we're talking about. 1980 to present would be really description of the gene variants and candidate gene studies, including in the epidemiologic literature, and about 2003 to the present sequencing of the entire human genome, and now more recently human genome. They all build on each other. They all build on the um, on the structure and function of the human gene. And at some point, certainly in the plausibility parts of your discussions, you really need to talk about. But in the end, here's the problem. You're drinking from the fire hose. A uh, concept that has come up in the genetics quite a bit is that too much data, and obviously uh, one of the things we need to tell you about is how to measure some of these things so you can boil the data down to something that we can all study on our uh, study populations. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for questions.
which is what this says. Bill. Why would you not just want to have a sequence of proteins and, and not have to fit those out uh, to make an RNA? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, actually, we want to, um, the questions, questioner should, maybe, Phil, why don't you ask the, the, your good question again? So, what's thought to be the purpose of introns? I guess you're, you're is this a religious question? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you know, nobody quite, know, quite knows. It used to be thought they were just sort of junk DNA that's in there and, and it just has to be spliced out. It probably has to do with the, the stability of the, of the messenger RNA and, and how it is, is um, sort of moves from the, the nucleus out into the nuclear, you know, out of the nuclear membrane and into the cytoplasm to be transcribed, uh, translated. Because it, it seems as though changes in the introns actually are not silent and they, they do affect um, both the way that the, the exons splice as well as um, the, the speed with which um, the, the translation and transcription occur. Um, so it probably has to do with folding of the, of the, um, uh, the DNA transcript essentially. But I, I don't know and I don't know that, that there are, are many who know, you know exactly what it is. I think it is interesting to look at the intron structure of some of the known genes. It's really quite variable. You know, if you looked at that um, BRCA gene, you know, there was just a, you know, the, the exons were very small. And there was a whole bunch of them. There's a lot of introns there. You just wonder if it had also something to do with um, perhaps the um, uh, the evolutionary um, facileness as well. In other words, the ability to to over to um, have um, variation uh, because you can then mix and match and these all these little uh, little bits of proteins rather than really relying on just one big chunk but I don't I don't know the answer either yeah and they, they also clearly the, the introns allow for alternative splicing so that you can you can take out different pieces of, of the you know the, of the exons so maybe you'd have the first five exons and then you might skip six or seven and then go to go to eight and the, and the way that the cell knows to do that probably has a lot to do with the molecular structure of that molecule that the introns help to define. You know, having read all these GWAS, I mean, it was almost like in the beginning as it was kind of an apology if someone found a gene in an intron and that, like it was, oh, this can't be real. And I don't, by the time two years went on, it didn't seem like that they were saying that anymore, that they'd seen this so often that it was really something that was very important in terms of variation. Another question? of a SNP in current uh, genome-wide studies come from the, um, the, the coding region, not from the intron or exon region? Uh, it, it actually uh, varies. The answer, I think, is that they come from uh, both. And um, if you look at uh, the, them, I, I haven't seen a study which has taken, say, literally hundreds of SNPs and classified them. Maybe you know about that. But uh, there are substantial numbers. Uh, um, actually, actually, the DB SNP has done that. Um, and there are, as you say, substantial numbers in exons, but there's also substantial numbers in, um, in introns and coding regions as well. Yeah, so the, the early platforms, everybody believed us, as, as I think you know, you're, you're suggesting, that, that the only thing that could possibly be important is the exon, so let's just focus on, on coding SNPs, C SNPs, as they, were, as they were often called. And there actually were platforms developed that were just coding SNPs and nothing else, um, 10,000 or 20,000 of, of the coding SNPs. The current platforms are developed in a, in a different way, and we'll talk about it a little bit in a, in a minute, um, to, in order to capture the breadth of variation regardless of where it is in the genome, basically, you know, based on on how many other SNPs are associated with the particular SNP you're measuring. So, so what the HapMap did was to sort of define those patterns of association among the SNPs and, and ask the question, if you, you know, if you only had to measure one, which would be the best one that would describe maybe 10, 15, 20 other SNPs? And so those can be in coding regions or non-coding regions. They're, they're anywhere in the genome. Um, depending on the, on the chemistry of the particular platform, 
Um, some of them are, are in places where um, uh, endo-arrival nucleases is actually chopped to DNA. The Affymetrix platform is built that way. Others are, are just, you know, assays that are developed for the best coding SNPs, essentially. But if you look at one of the, uh, the, the SNP platforms, a small minority of the SNPs on that platform will be to exons. Yeah. And, and, and of all those listed in DB SNP, um, one of the smallest groups is the exons. Yeah. 